Let's be honest, who doesn't deserve a pay rise? Factory workers, they deserve one. Nurses, hospital porters, bar staff, security guards, waiters, taxi drivers. Name me one of those groups that don't deserve a bump in their pay packets. And what about cleaners, supermarket workers or police officers who haven't seen a raise for years and yet put their lives at risk on a daily basis? What about babysitters, nursery workers, people toiling in care homes? The list goes on. Try looking at any of those groups in the eye and tell them they don't deserve a raise. I detested the idea of essential and non-essential workers during the pandemic. All workers are essential in my book if they contribute to the economy. Anyone that worked through the pandemic is a hero to me. Funny word that, hero, isn't it? It's used very selectively because it's the latest fashion to divide people up into groups based upon a moral hierarchy. We had the deification of NHS staff who were amazing, but how many millions of other British workers made their contribution during the pandemic too? Prison guards, refuse workers, farmers, salespeople, the military. I'm not keen on this fetishization of any particular workforce. And so as the economy emerges from the greatest trauma since the Second World War, although this time self-inflicted as a result of the disastrous failed experiment of lockdown, sadly, talk of pay rises is off the table for everyone. The country is on its uppers. We're skint with £2 trillion worth of debt and a deficit, which means more goes out than comes in. Britain is broke. Finito, the end which is why we must call time on the proposed rail strikes next week, which are not just bonkers, foolish and wrong. They are deeply unethical. Any strikes during a time of severe economic crisis are reckless, dangerous and deeply irresponsible. These strikes are, in fact, deeply immoral because they will prolong and amplify the suffering that so many are going through now. Do you honestly think that our economy can weather yet more damage next week? Given that rail is a critical part of our infrastructure for the transport of goods and for getting people to work and to the shops, the cost of next week's strikes could run into billions. That's billions more being added to the national debt to be paid for, of course, by future generations upon whom we have already shat from a great height with school closures and other COVID measures already an insult to their futures. It was the unions who threatened Britain with bankruptcy in the 70s. And for her many imperfections, it was only the bold leadership of Margaret Thatcher who stood up to them and said no more. Trade union reform in the 80s transformed Britain from being the sick man of Europe, permanently on strike, with unburied bodies in the graveyard, and going to the International Monetary Fund with our begging bowl to becoming an economic, military and diplomatic powerhouse. In 1979, Britain was broke and broken. By 1987, however, we were on top of the world, transforming Britain into a modern, efficient, competitive economy. And all of that was a legacy largely preserved under new labour. Yes, they made mistakes, but they were business friendly, aspirational and kept taxes low. The legacy of fiscal responsibility, strong trade relations and a sensible role for the unions remains to this day why we enjoy the status of fifth economy in the world. If we'd allowed Britain to continue being dictated to by out of control unions, we'd probably be a few notches above Venezuela by now paying for loaves of bread with suitcases of cash. Which brings me to inflation, the worst tax of all, one which annihilates everyone's pay packet. And inflation is something that disproportionately impacts the poorest in society. Which is why I can't understand why Labour won't condemn the strikes. Maybe they're in the union's pocket. 
It's been reported this week that five Labour MPs who have supported the strikes have received funding from the RMT, totalling £20,000. Funny that. And Wes Streeting, the shadow health secretary, who I do like, told a BBC Question Time audience that he would be out protesting with the rail workers if he were in their situation. But to give in to the rail unions next week will spark copycat strikes across multiple industries and will simply feed the monster of inflation because pay rises will involve the printing of more empty billions and will further stoke the national debt, which leaves us, of course, exposed to higher interest rates. Anyone responsible for a household's finance will tell you that debt is a noose around your neck. If left unchecked, it is economic quicksand. Once you start sinking, you may not get back up again. Ask Greece. Now, we must have trade unions, and without them, we would be living in Dickensian Britain. It's disgusting how workers have been treated by greedy bosses over the years whilst enriching shareholders. I want all Brits to get a great wage for a great day's work, and work must pay. But the unions have picked the wrong battle at the wrong time. Next week is a test case for economic good sense. It's time for economic prudence, and the strikes are anything but. In fairness to the government, and of course I'm horrified by the damage they've done over the last two years, but they are currently practising what they preach. Michael Gove said this week that there won't be tax cuts for the next couple of years until we get on top of inflation. Not a palatable or popular message, but it may be the right one. Inflation is the common enemy now and must be defeated, closely followed by the likes of the RMT, who are, in my view, overplaying their hand with next week's action. The public, struggling to make ends meet as we speak, will be furious if they can't get to work or go about their lives. By threatening to inflict more economic damage with strikes next week, they're threatening human damage too. The health secretary, Sajid Javid, said lives will be lost as health workers are unable to get into hospitals. Do the unions really want blood on their hands? And young people, punch drunk from two years of needless school closures, requested by teaching unions, I hasten to add, may now not be able to sit their exams. And I won't take any lectures from the unions about inflation. The cost of living is, in fact, the cost of lockdown. And it was the unions across the board who pushed for work-from-home measures and strict COVID protocols and who sought policies like test and trace and furlough, which cost all those billions. I always said the experimental COVID measures would come at a price, and here we are. If you're partly responsible for smashing the economy with measures that you asked for, you are at this point in no position to further plunder its scarce resources. The unions once threatened to bankrupt Britain. They are now having a good go at doing it again. It's the worst sequel since The Hangover 2, but the headache from this one will be far worse.